Welcome everyone. It's a really great pleasure to open this spring's lecture series with Bjarke Ingels, here to share with us the work of his practice, Big. There are few architects who need less of an introduction than Bjarke today. Just look at this auditorium this evening and the long line that formed already early this afternoon. And I know that the auditorium next door is also completely filled. The sheer scale of Bjarke's reach and the impact not only of his work, but of himself as a new kind of architect, as public intellectual for our time is undoubtable. Whether you're a fan or a critic, no one can remain indifferent to where Big has taken architecture and the discourse on cities today. You cannot deny that the practice has become one of the most influential architectural practices in the world. And so to introduce Bjarke this evening, I thought I would share some more personal notes that dive back a little in time. I first met Bjarke in 1999 when we were both recently hired as junior designers to work for the Office for Metropolitan Architecture in Rotterdam. Bjarke was part of the team for the Seattle Public Library, and already then his design talents combined with his upbeat demeanor rendered him a unique figure in the office, sharply standing out amongst a high concentration of young, hungry, and ambitious architects from around the world. But let me expand for a moment on the word upbeat. <laughs> Imagine a 7 p.m. stressed out architectural office where most project teams are gearing up for many more hours of intense work, and suddenly a young Bjarke, who looks very much like the Bjarke of today, <laughs> shows up smiling and full of energy with what looks like snowboarding pants featuring a fluorescent stripe matching the blonde stripe in his fiery hair zipping through the office on rollerblades. <laughs> That's a beat. Even with this simple gesture of an optimistic, willful and spectacular entry into the often overwhelming reality of the work at hand, and its grinding effects, Bjarke was already declaring an architectural stance vis-a-vis -vis the world and the question of architectural engagement. The stance combined with wicked talent and freshness has given Bjarke an innate capacity to carve opportunities for architecture and design out of almost everything he touches, rendering his astonishing trajectory over the past two decades as almost no surprise. As a young office in Denmark, Bjarke's first partnership plot produced some of the most seminal housing projects of the recent past, as well as a set of small yet uniquely original public buildings. Today, Bjarke heads an over 500-person firm with offices in Copenhagen, New York, London, and Barcelona, and whose fearless commitment to bringing design and architecture to the rethinking and building of everything has led to the firm's prolific work from housing developments to resilient and public parks, Lego mountains, museums, and more. Big has uniquely reshaped the relationship between design and corporate practices, challenging the traditional opposition between the two and supporting a broader and more competitive environment. The result has been better architecture all around, formally, programmatically, typologically, and more, as well as a renewed commitment to the urban realm. There are many perspectives one can bring to examine the extensive body of work Bjarke and his practice Big have produced in a short time. What stands out to me as the most important contribution Big has made is to demonstrate to a very wide audience, from private clients and developers to governments, institutional, cultural, and others, that architecture and design matter. Bjarke's consistent design position the strength of his body of work, as well as his unwavering commitment to bringing architecture at its best to every possible corner of the built environment is inspiring for the challenges it has raised for the profession and its agency today. And it is in this sense that I believe we should ourselves engage with Big's commitment as the practice continues to advance new territory for architecture in the world. Bjarke's energy, talent, and relentless pursuit of design opportunities as well as his capacity to question the discipline and profession in light of our contemporary condition renders him an important figure as we grapple with architecture's capacities today and for the future. Please join me in welcoming Bjarke Engel. Thank you. What a, what a great introduction. It's been a while since I actually spoke um, in a, in a kind of academic setting, so uh, I, I took the opportunity to uh, 
put together uh, an almost entirely new uh, set of slides. Uh, so I apologize in advance if, it, if it's a little uh, incoherent. But um, what, what, I, what I tried to um, put together is maybe also to describe how um, incredibly uh, a, a mixed bag of, uh, of interests and focuses and concerns and what a sort of com completely mixed bag of, of different scales that, that you can end up uh, consuming all of your time with as, a, as an architect. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll, I'll sort of try to see if I can, um, if I can sort of uh, uh, extract some meaning out of it as, as, uh, as it advances. But, um, but essentially maybe starting with the, with the smallest project that we have uh, <clears throat> created so far, but, but maybe also one of the most complex this is uh, René Redzepi. Uh, he is uh, by, by many uh, uh, seen as one of the best chefs uh, in the world. Uh, he pioneered um, the kind of regionalistic uh, cuisine uh, with his uh, restaurant Noma, uh, in, uh, located in, in Copenhagen, uh, where he sort of pioneered this idea of actually, in, in the case of Noma, which is short for Nordic food, Nordic mel in Danish, Noma, um, that he kind of rediscovered the Nordic landscapes, uh, the flora and fauna of, uh, of Nordic nature, and, and, and sort of returned the attention to see how that, those, those plants and those animals could actually be uh, seen as haute cuisine, because haute cuisine has been dominated by, <clears throat> um, by French and, and, and Asian cuisine. And, and, and also, like, I think the, the place where, where we really align with him was that he, he came up with this idea that that, that maybe healthy could also be incredibly delicious. Um, we have this notion we call hedonistic sustainability that sustainable can actually be more enjoyable. Sustainable cities, sustainable uh, buildings can be more enjoyable, not just good for the environment, but also great for the people living there. He's somehow done that to, um, to food. Um, and uh, he came to us because he wanted to move his restaurant from, from where it was. He was gonna shut it down. He went to Mexico, to Tulum for a few months uh, and cooked uh, on the beach there uh, to, uh, to this new place, uh, which is in the middle of um, uh, Christiania, this kind of hippie commune uh, in, in Copenhagen. Uh, it's, it's part of the old fortification of, uh, of Copenhagen, which also makes it a historical uh, landmark. Um, it's, so it, it used to be the, the fortress. When Christiania came, it became this kind of uh, uh, the, the hippies invaded in 1969, and they never left. Uh, you can buy uh, mild drugs uh, openly uh, in Christiania. This is what um, this is the, the main part of the building is an old uh, mine, sea mine storage. Um, this is what it, it looked like when we uh, when we came to it, and and we thought the the city was gonna g you know give us a medal for for trying to make it nice. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it turned out that the, the city had this attitude that as long as it was only deteriorating organically, everything was fine. But as soon as we started trying to repair it, uh, everything uh, was incredibly restricted. Um, also, there was another sort of challenge because um, uh, Rene was going to change his uh, restaurant. It was not only going to be uh, regionalistic, it was also going to be seasonal. So he invented three seasons instead of four. Uh, New Year to April, everything from the sea, uh, because everything else is dead in uh, Scandinavian nature. So the sea is where you go for like seaweed uh, and, and seafood and anything that can be fermented or pickled. Uh, uh, May to September, uh, vegetable season, because that's actually when the nature in Scandinavia can feed humans. And then uh, October to, uh, to January, uh, game and forest. So basically venison, uh, berries and roots. Um, and, and, you know, his idea has been this kind of rediscovering traditional Nordic elements. This is what the, the context looks like. It's kind of this kind of self-built uh, hippie commune in the old uh, 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 Navy Yards. This is actually what sort of traditional uh, uh, Nordic uh, villages look like. Somehow, this kind of, even though uh, Scandinavians like to dress in, in black, they like to paint their houses in bright colors. And, and, and where the, uh, you know, the Southern Europeans push them together to create urbanity uh, in, in the Arctics and the Nordics, they're somehow spread apart. Um, and, 
and in the end, like sort of a, maybe our main inspiration came from this kind of typical uh, 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 Nordic farm, which is essentially an accumulation of individual houses. Each house is built for its own purpose, for the main family, for the, you know, the children, uh, as, as you know, the, fa the family and the generations grow, for the potatoes, for the animals, for the workshop. Um, so this was the, the site, the old uh, mine storage. And then it quickly became clear that we could only place buildings in the footprints of where there had been buildings in the past. Uh, so it was kind of very limited repertoire. Uh, the entire back of house, all the labs and the kind of preparation kitchens fit perfectly inside the, the existing building. Um, and then we basically created this kind of mini village of all the other programs of the, uh, of the restaurant. Um, and finally, in the, in the three last footprints, uh, greenhouses, because this is it's almost like an urban farm. They actually grow uh, a lot of the, uh, the ingredients that they're, uh, that they're serving. So you have the preparation kitchen and the final service kitchen. The service kitchen, and this is because they, they, they make sort of 20 servings. Uh, so they came up with this kind of panopticon idea that Rene wants to be in the middle of everything from the kind of central position. He wants to overview the entire restaurant. And in return, the entire restaurant can see him uh, and his team. So, so we ended up designing for each room a particular building that is made with, you know, as, as few materials as possible, mostly one material uh, on the inside and the outside, and, and connected into this kind of little, uh, little square. So, uh, so here you see the sort of uh, ensemble. Um, actually, Pete Udolf uh, has created uh, this kind of incredible permaculture garden here uh, in the front, where they grow uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the plants. As you arrive, uh, uh, you're actually waiting to be seated inside the greenhouses. And then the experimental uh, kitchen where Rene prepares uh, uh, the sort of next season's uh, uh, dinner uh, is, is on the way, and then you find yourself to this kind of little cluster of, uh, of buildings. Uh, the first building is essentially uh, the entrance. It's, a, it's one big wardrobe, uh, a kind of wooden cabinet where you get rid of your, your coat, uh, and then you sort of enter into this uh, central uh, square, if you like, um, covered by glass. Uh, like all the different buildings are protected from, uh, from the environment, but, but one of the things that Rene was insisted on was that when you are a seasonal chef, it's very important to be constantly aware of the weather. If it's gonna be <clears throat> cold tomorrow, if it's gonna be wet tomorrow, what kind of ingredients you can get. A lot of the menu is actually only found by foraging because the ingredients have not been labeled as ingredients, so there's no farmer making it. You have to find it in the forests or the parks of, uh, of Copenhagen. So then the, the main building, of course, is the, uh, is the, is the chef's kitchen. Um, the entire uh, ceiling is, uh, is a ventilation so that you can actually cook openly in the middle of, uh, of the space. You are, it, it's the only building that doesn't have any walls. Uh, all the air is, uh, is sucked out. Uh, the main dining uh, is made entirely out of oak, floor, walls, and ceiling. And in this case, so almost this idea like, like like their cuisine that they use very traditional ingredients, but in a slightly different way. Here we stacked it, uh, the, 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 the boards, almost like a Josef Beuys, um, this kind of s solid stack of, uh, uh, of uh, oak boards. The, the entire facade can open up into the, into the permaculture garden uh, in the summer. Uh, light comes in from the, from the top, again, reminding you of the, uh, of the weather. And this kind of solid, uh, Solid wall, the same material both outside and inside. Oak is a hardwood, so it can actually uh, endure uh, uh, the outdoor weather. Um, as, you, as you move on to, uh, to the next, the, the, uh, the private dining um, is pine wood. This kind of typical Scandinavian, uh, more pale uh, uh, wood, uh, also on all surfaces. Uh, the shelving is the construction, uh, and again, you sort of take the the nature on the fortification uh, in. Uh, pine can't be outside untreated, so uh, uh, actually uh, um, uh, Rene and his chefs, we were so behind on construction before opening day and they already sold uh, the first uh, seating. So it ended up being uh, the chefs with their creme brulee uh, torches uh, uh, treating the outside uh, 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 against uh, uh, the elements. So the, the torched wood uh, makes it uh, 
capable of being uh, outdoor. Uh, the lounge, uh, um, the fireplace is also the, uh, the skylight. Um, it's like this kind of traditional uh, Danish red brick. And to make it bright on the inside, it switches to uh, a white clay brick. Um, again, working with the tectonics of, uh, uh, of brick, but in this case, sort of to, to also resolve that the, the window sill becomes the ceiling held by the, by the brick. And, and again, this idea that you can open up uh, the entire corner and bring, bring in the elements uh, uh, when the season allows. Um, and again, like the brick, it's the same brick that actually constitutes the, the ceiling, like a ziggurat, more like a, like a traditional uh, 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 roof. The, the grill, the barbecue is, uh, is, is like a ventilated, a cross-ventilated chimney so that the, the chefs can stand uh, in the, as cold as possible uh, uh, with, uh, with the fire. Uh, the waiter's room is almost like a cabinet with a, with a skylight. And then finally, the, the old warehouse, we just installed a, a gigantic uh, shelf uh, that sort of organizes all the different aspects, uh, the different parts of the kitchen, the social spaces for the staff, and just cutting a single skylight in, uh, in the ceiling. But, but almost like this kind of trying to, to really take the entire sensibility and the entire philosophy of of Rene and Noma and, and try to create a portraiture or capture the essence, what would be the architectural equivalent of, uh, of what, uh, what Rene has, uh, has created. Um, and, and, and of course also like I think um, a kind of powerful manifestation of this kind of idea of an urban ecology that, that this, this restaurant is in the middle of, uh, of, of Copenhagen, uh, but actually the the honey uh, is made there. Uh, uh, most of the uh, ingredients uh, that you're eating are, are actually made in the middle of, uh, of, the, of the city. And then across it, um, a radically different uh, example of, of hedonistic sustainability and, and urban ecology, uh, a project that we spent the last uh, nine years uh, uh, making. This is, uh, this is Noma. This is my houseboat. Uh, and, and this is... Uh, this is basically uh, the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Uh, Denmark has become a little bit of a, of a pioneer in the sense that only 4% of our waste goes into a landfill. 42% is recycled and 54% uh, is transformed into district heating and electricity. As a power source, six pounds of garbage from your kitchen uh, turns into four hours of electricity and five hours of domestic heating. It's replacing the power plant in this photo right in the middle of, the, of Copenhagen. This is the opera. This is the Royal Theater uh, right next to the marina. And, and it was clear when we, when we did the competition nine years ago that what was mesmerizing about this was this kind of marvel of modern engineering that it was going to be the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. No toxins coming out of the chimney. So we thought maybe a mountain of trash could become an actual mountain. Uh, our nearest ski slope in Copenhagen is six hours away uh, in Isabau in Sweden. We could put two-thirds of Isabau's main slope on the roof of the power plant. Uh, and so we did. Uh, this is what it looked like the, this spring um, before, uh, before opening. As you can see, there's still a little bit of, of vegetation uh, missing. Um, this is what it looked like uh, uh, in the winter. Um, so, uh, of course, the, the kind of cliff face uh, of the mountain is made out of these gigantic uh, folded uh, raw aluminum uh, bricks that are actually planters this spring. They're going to be uh, uh, full of, uh, uh, of green. Um, raw aluminum tilted so they actually reflect the surroundings so that the building changes color uh, over, the, over the course of the day. Inside, the mountain, you have the entire administration uh, overlooking the city, and then of course they, they look the city at, at the one side, and then they overview this marvel of, of modern engineering. It's also rather unusual because the entire power plant is actually daylit. 50% uh, of the facade is, is transparent, and so you have the administration inside, uh, and of course you, you see the underside of the, of the mountain that is above, the elevator ride, up to the top of the ski hill is looking into this uh, uh, amazing space. Um, 
this spring, it's going to open the tallest climbing wall in the world, uh, 300 feet. Uh, the, I have no idea who's going to be climbing uh, this thing. Um, and of course, this kind of x-ray uh, at night. And of course, like the fifth facade, in this case, the roof is maybe the most exciting facade. Um, it has skiing, and, and the skiing is for free. It's a public park. If you want to use the lift system, you have to buy a lift pass. Uh, it's sort of designed to be able to sort of help spread um, vegetation to the surrounding uh, sort of post-industrial area. <clears throat> you have hiking paths, <clears throat> different kind of activity zones. You have uh, a kind of vegetation that changes uh, uh, over the course of the, uh, of the season. Uh, there's more than 400 different uh, 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 trees, uh, and, and in general, it's this, it's, it's almost like, like Noma, that it's purely indigenous species. If Denmark had mountains, this is probably what, what, what they would look like. Um, also, the entire roof park uh, has been made for a budget of um, around um, 13 million dollars, uh, which is absurdly uh, inexpensive, so, so everything has really been done with the, with the purpose of the least amount of, uh, of maintenance uh, uh, and, and the least sort of uh, uh, acquisition cost. Um, maybe when I saw this photo, I, it dawned on me how insane it was that we were actually making a building with a ski lift uh, on the roof. Um, and, and maybe the most sort of important material, because uh, Denmark or Copenhagen doesn't have enough snow to be a, a serious a ski destination. So we searched around and we found uh, an Italian company uh, that makes this kind of uh, mat that has the same uh, friction as a groomed slope. Uh, the only problem was that it was quite ugly. Um, also because, <clears throat> because of the thermal expansion and contraction, it had to be split up in these like, let's call it seven by seven foot squares. So we actually sat down together with the, the company, and in a course of a few months, we managed to develop an entire new product for them. And it's very simple. You have the old product on the left and, uh, and our proposition on, on the right. Simply by joining uh, every two circles in two different directions, uh, the sort of the basic grid goes from squares to rectangles with six knots, which means that when they expand, they can become hexagons, and when they contract, they can become these kind of bow ties, which means that you can actually have one single continuous surface. So like this kind of very simple geometric invention uh, that was then turned into the production, and now it's the standard product of the company, meant that we could actually have a continuous uh, surface on the, whole, uh, uh, on the whole roof for the, for the first time. Uh, we color coded it so that uh, the brighter the slope is, uh, the less likely you are to crash into the perimeter. Um, and, and eventually the grass grows through uh, because the grass is a major part of the structure that holds the, the mat to the roof. So uh, eventually it's going to be like skiing on, uh, on, a, on, a, on an alpine meadow. So here you see some of the first tests uh, uh, that we did. Um, so uh, you can kind of hear and see that it has, it has the feeling of a groomed slope, which also makes it kind of perfect for freestyle skiers because you can actually uh, do all of the, the, the grinds and the jumps and the tricks uh, as, as you could on a, uh, on a normal slope. <clears throat> so I think what, what's amazing about this, this idea is that um, um, I think it kind of shows this kind of almost like world-changing power of, uh, of architecture that the, my, my son is, is one year old now, so, so he's never going to remember that there was a time when you couldn't ski on the power plant in Copenhagen. Uh, so, so for him and his entire generation, that's going to be their normal. And that's going to be the, the, the starting point from where they start having crazy ideas uh, about their future. Uh, so that, that can almost make you angst about thinking about the, uh, what kind of future they're, they're going to come, come up with. Um, so of course, like some, some kind of, I think also kind of a, a landmark for, for this kind of idea of, of hedonistic sustainability that a sustainable city can also be uh, not just better for the environment, but, but better for the people living there. 
um, an another sort of aspect that, that has been following us is, is this kind of relationship between um, you know, the, pra the pragmatic and the utopian, or let's say the, the, ut the two utilitarian and the, and the social. Um, one such example is this is basically where uh, Granville Bridge touches downtown uh, Vancouver. We got invited to, to look at turning it into a, a, a mostly residential and also educational development. So we just started mapping the constraints. There are setbacks from the streets, setbacks from the bridges. Uh, the city has a rule that you cannot build uh, residences closer than 30 meters or 100 feet to the, to the traffic on the bridge. There's a park where we're not supposed to cast any shadows. And finally, we were left with this tiny triangular footprint, <laughs> almost too small to build. So, so then we started thinking, like, if the, if the purpose of the 100-foot uh, setback is a minimum distance, once we get 100 feet up in the air, we can grow the building back. Uh, so essentially, the triangular footprint turns into a rectangle. Uh, we managed to get the city to agree with, uh, uh, with this interpretation. So when you drive over Granville Bridge, it's sort of as if someone is pulling a curtain aside, welcoming you to, to Vancouver. This kind of gradual overhang. Um, and underneath the bridge, uh, we worked with a series of, of, of local artists. You have uh, basically a university in these two triangular buildings that are wedged in between the legs of the, of the bridge. Uh, and then uh, Rodney Graham uh, uh, proposed to create, uh, turn one of his uh, video artworks into a giant urban artwork with this gigantic uh, uh, chandelier uh, that basically is, uh, um, uh, sort of ro rolls up and then sort of twice a day it sort of drops and spins uh, dramatically uh, uh, down above the, the main street. Uh, and the idea is once, once open that the entire underside is going to turn into what we've nicknamed the Sistine's Chapel of Street Art, uh, but basically trying to turn the otherwise negative impact of the bridge into, uh, into a positive. So, so what ends up looking like this kind of almost like surreal silhouette is actually like a very precise analysis and response to uh, uh, a very difficult uh, sort of urban, uh, urban situation. It, it's going to open uh, in, in, in May uh, and is already now like really one of the more striking uh, uh, places in, uh, in Vancouver. So, so this is an example of what we, what we like to call social infrastructure, the idea that infrastructure can have positive social and environmental side effects. Um, almost the opposite, if, if, the, if a bridge can turn into an art museum upside down, uh, the opposite could also be true. Um, a project that uh, we did in exactly the same space of time as, as Vancouver, uh, is a project for a small art museum in a sculpture park in, uh, in Norway. And, and we could basically place, there's uh, sculptures on either side of a river, there's an old historical mill, and we could place the museum anywhere we wanted. Um, and in the end, our proposal was to turn it into the bridge that turns the entire complex of parks on either side into one single uh, loop. Uh, the museum has two galleries, uh, one daily galleries with views over the water and one sort of more vertical, more in, uh, enclosed gallery. Um, the transition from one to the other uh, becomes this kind of distortion, uh, a 90 degree rotation. And, um, and from, the, from the starting point, we had this idea that, that the museum could be seen as maybe one of the bigger sculptures in the sculpture park. Um, of course, once we started getting more intimate with how to make it span, it's a 250 foot span. So a pretty mature uh, column-free uh, free span. The, the cross sections are incredibly rational, like a series of rotated uh, rectangles. Um, so here you see the, the kind of raw structure. But the raw structure had some kind of a, because it is a bit of a, of a mission to make a, a building as a span 250 feet over a river. So it had this kind of Eiffel Tower aesthetic that, that wasn't really what we were looking for. Uh, and it looked maybe more sort of muscular than, than the kind of effortlessness that we had fantasized about. Um, so we tried to imagine how, how could we um, finish the building. Uh, 
And, uh, and in the end, the, the idea became this kind of very simple idea of taking a lot of completely standard uh, elements, um, standard uh, uh, aluminum profiles on the outside, standard wooden sticks on the inside, uh, and just basically shift them ever so slightly. So it's, in a way, an incredibly traditional, conventional kind of uh, structure. Uh, in, in the joinery of the, of the wood, we also resolve all of the necessary technical installations. This is the almost finished building. Um, and, and, and like very classic kind of Norwegian wood carpentry uh, that ends up creating uh, this kind of very, very precise uh, complex geometry, sort of a hyperbolic uh, paraboloid. Uh, as the as the as the floor turns into the to the wall, it, it reveals a, a gap that becomes also the, the ventilation, uh, the sprinkling, the the light installations, the security, everything that makes it a contemporary art museum is is also integrated in this kind of very rectilinear logic. So even though you see curves uh, and arches everywhere, every single element in the building is uh, is completely straight. So, so somehow, like in a way, trying to hack the kind of conventional, traditional uh, building techniques that are available to create something, uh, let's call it extraordinary out of the ordinary. And here you see how the, the skylight zips and, and turns uh, the more vertical part of the building into a completely introverted. And here you have this kind of spectacular view over the, the river and the mill. And on the outside, again, it's like this is basically um, this kind of extruded aluminum facade that you put outside um, thermal warehouses. So in a way, the most conventional, traditional kind of barn, uh, but again, uh, put together in a way that it describes this kind of uh, acrobatic uh, geometry. And then, then so of course, the, the irony is that I think we spent the same amount of time on, on this building as we did on the, on the power plant uh, and it also just shows how, how undiscriminating you are as an architect with, with what you actually devote your, your time to, uh, trying to make uh, a building, uh, a, a, a small art gallery float over a river, or trying to uh, turn a power plant into a, a ski slope. Um, also, uh, of course, from the other side, it has this kind of even more abstract sort of sculptural quality that really makes it uh, like one of the sculptures in the, in the sculpture park. Underneath, you can see the only other room, apart from the main sort of Kunsthaus space, is uh, the toilets. Um, the client was obsessed uh, with the toilets. Uh, so, uh, so basically, you, you enter below the belly of the bridge. So it's, you see the steel structure ending and the foundations. Uh, um, this kind of uh, glass stair uh, that takes you down. You can see the sort of where the bridge meets uh, the foundation. There's this kind of uh, expansion gap. Um, MK and Draxet, the, the Danish-Norwegian uh, artist group, created this kind of voyeuristic uh, sculpture uh, looking in to the toilets. Uh, and when you look over his shoulder, you actually look at the belly of the, uh, of the beast uh, with the reflections of the water uh, underneath it. Uh, and as you continue down, uh, underneath the glass stair, you actually have the, the actual bathrooms. The glass stair it has a projections by Tony Orsler that makes you feel that you're actually listening to conversations happening inside the, the, the toilets. And, and when you think you're finally going to be left in peace uh, inside the stall, you actually have uh, these classic Orsler uh, installations uh, whispering in your ear uh, as you're trying to complete the mission. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, so, so essentially, the, um, let's say another example of like, let's say at least this kind of idea of social infrastructure that, that one thing can also be the other, that something cultural can also be infrastructural and, uh, and vice versa. Um, and, and, and then of course, like maybe speeding up a little bit, like, so, uh, so even though I, I believe that we, we come to each project with a kind of consistent attitude because so much is discovered in the process that the, the conditions are always so different 
uh, what you have to respond to uh, is so different that it ends up creating rather different um, vocabularies. An almost invisible building uh, is a museum, uh, a bunker museum on the west coast of Denmark. It's basically in this kind of giant nature reserve on the west coast of Denmark. Uh, the only th exception is this old German bunker left from the Second World War, uh, a gun turret. Uh, a, a gun was uh, delivered from Krupps in Germany uh, and was supposed to be installed uh, on September 9, 1945, for good reasons that never happened. Um, and next to it, um, inside the dunes, we were asked to make a museum telling the story. Uh, and because it's an entirely listed landscape, uh, our proposal became to make these kind of very precise incisions um, and almost imagine the opposite of the bunker. If the bunker is a heavy uh, artifact in the dunes, uh, the museum became uh, this kind of light absence. As you slice through the sand, uh, the sand becomes concrete. Um, and you have this uh, square, uh, entirely transparent, bringing daylight uh, deep into this kind of underground uh, museum. Um, you descend into this narrative of the Second World War, the, the occupation of Denmark, um, using only materials that are already found in the bunker, so the concrete, uh, the raw iron, uh, the raw wood. Um, solving all of the sort of technical installations for the uh, museography in the, in the tectonics of the, of the concrete work, um, so that all technique, uh, all sprinkling, all lighting, all hanging is done uh, within the, the tectonics of, uh, of the foam work. Um, daylight being sucked in, so even when we're entirely underground, it feels very light and airy, almost the opposite of the bunker. And then from here, an umbilical cord takes you deep into uh, uh, the bunker where you can sort of explore what's, uh, what's left uh, as this kind of giant artifact from, uh, from the Second World War. So you can say almost like the, the disappearing act uh, and the discretion almost becomes the most characteristic of uh, uh, what makes the building stand out in a way is what also makes it uh, disappear. Um, and, and then there's the thing about architects is that Part of the, the pleasure of the profession, and I, I think often we talk so much about the social agenda or the environmental agenda, whatever, and there's also just an aspect of architecture which is the pure thrill uh, of making something uh, and making it as nice as you can possibly get away with. Um, and uh, uh, this is a site not dissimilar to the other one, but in this case, not depicting the story of the Second World War, but the, this is our site. It's Valley du Choux, uh, the cradle of watchmaking in Switzerland. Uh, it's where Audemars and Piquet started making watches 150 years ago. Um, and, and I never had much of an interest in watchmaking until I went to visit their uh, workshop, invited uh, to make this proposal for a small uh, invited competition. And I met this kind of wa master watchmaker, and he made me aware of the fact that today we're so used to the divorce between hardware and software, uh, between essentially form and content, that the hardware is kind of this neutral, always identical, and it's the software that gives it attribute and character and, and use. But in watchmaking and in architecture, the hardware is actually the software. It's the geometry and the interlocking of gears and materials, and let's call it spaces, that makes the clockwork work and the building work. So we ended up trying to sort of create that. They, they had this idea of a, of a linear, a chronological uh, exhibition, um, but that you should be able to sort of dig through and, and make shortcuts. So we sort of coiled the chronology into this kind of double spiral uh, that leads to a, a central gallery in the middle and then unwinds again. Uh, the roof follows the, the slope of the landscape, bringing daylight uh, and, and views uh, deep into, into the floor plate. This is our first sort of architectural model. This is the, the building uh, almost complete. Um, so essentially this kind of ressort spiral, which is the, the element inside the, uh, the watch that makes it uh, 
uh, that makes it store kinetic energy and eventually tick. Um, there's not a single column in the, in the entire building. It's as if the, the spiral is floating above you. The, the glass is actually uh, uh, load-bearing. Uh, it's again one of the elements of watchmaking is to provide the maximum impact with the minimum of material. Skeletonization, miniaturization, complication is all about reducing the amount of material. Um, uh, and part of the museum is that you can actually look over the shoulders of some of the expert watchmakers uh, and ask them questions while they're trying to uh, put very small things uh, uh, together. Um, and of course, at any time, you can jump from one uh, part of the chronology uh, to the other. So here you have this kind of almost surreal experience where the, the entire roof seems to be hovering uh, uh, over your head. You enter from the existing uh, historical building uh, and, and enter into the, uh, into the spiral. It's, um, it's this kind of minergie, uh, um, environmentally high-performing building, so we needed to provide passive uh, sun shading uh, and develop this, uh, uh, this kind of un undulating uh, ribbons of, uh, of brass that have the, the effect that from the angle of the sun, they're opaque, but when you look at them straight from the inside, they're entirely transparent, almost to the point where they really uh, disappear. Uh, and then I, I just say, like, for any architect uh, who dreams about potentially doing something that is close to a perfectly built building, working in Switzerland, uh, where practically everybody is a watchmaker at heart, for watchmakers is, is close to as good as it gets. Uh, so I, uh, we've never seen concrete or, or metalwork or glasswork uh, 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 like this. So, so, so in a way, like, to some extent, a, a building so for the pure thrill of celebrating the craftsmanship of, of watchmaking and of, uh, of architecture. Um, and then maybe a, a last um, smaller building before we escalate um, is uh, um, a cultural institution we just opened in, uh, in, in Bordeaux, in France bringing three uh, different uh, cultural institutions together uh, in a new building, uh, uh, a library, a mediatek, uh, a performance space, and a, uh, and a contemporary art center. Uh, the art galleries on the top uh, uh, to have uh, access to skylights uh, and connected by a, a shared lobby uh, on the waterfront of the Le Garonne in, in Bordeaux. Um, and basically, the, the, the library and the and the theater uh, creating the two pillars, uh, the art museum, the bridge, uh, to enclose uh, a big public room. The entire building finished in a prefabricated uh, concrete. You can really see that the French invented uh, steel reinforced concrete uh, because they are so incredibly good at it. Also, the sand in the south of France is so insanely beautiful. That's why Unitivitation in, uh, in Marseille is maybe the only truly beautiful of the unités that Corp did because of the, of the quality of the sand. Um, so essentially the three institutions enclosing this giant outdoor urban room uh, where the three institutions but also the city itself can, uh, 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 can invade. On the inside, it's basically a 150,000 square foot building with a $40 million budget, uh, which sounds completely ridiculous by New York standards, but it's still pretty ridiculous uh, by European standards. So uh, we had this kind of positive side effect that all the finishes inside are so insanely raw. Uh, it's, basically, uh, it's basically concrete. Uh, um, in, 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 in different shades. Uh, for the opening, uh, Benoit Maire, uh, a local uh, Bordeaux artist, uh, made this uh, head of Hermes uh, that is uh, sliced so exactly where the void of the building is pushed out to create a big public room. Uh, the, the sculpture is also absent, so in a way the, the most exciting part of the sculpture, the most exciting part of the building is, is what's not there. Uh, and then inside, there's almost like Le Corbusier level of raw finish. 
even the furniture is cast out of concrete, uh, some of it tiled. Um, there's a periscope from the lobby uh, that looks up. So here you're actually standing uh, at the bottom looking up at the people. So you can kind of see it's a, it's a giant sloping mirror that allows you to see what's happening on the square above you. Uh, the ballerinas can look out over the, the square and vice versa. Um, actually, at the opening, uh, there was the first demonstration where they said, um, congratulations with the cultural building, but what about the two and a half thousand homeless in Bordeaux? So it was clear that I think in the first 24 hours, I saw you know, a, a couple making out, the first skaters, of course, arriving, and the first uh, demonstration. Uh, the theater, again, uh, this kind of mosaic of tarred wood, uh, um, hot rolled steel, and black concrete to create the, the perfect sort of acoustic uh, mix. And finally, this kind of art barn at the top uh, and a sculptural park looking over the city. But essentially, in this kind of very sort of simple building, the, the main gesture being the sort of the pr uh, providing this kind of new shaded and covered outdoor space for, um, for the cultural life of the city. Um, so, so then sort of, I'd, I'd like to finish by like escalating a little bit in, uh, in scale and maybe uh, impact. Um, one project that we've spent the last uh, year and a half on is for a new uh, baseball stadium for the Oakland A's. And Stadia, this is their current stadium, and this is typical for Stadia. It's like these kind of massive venues in a giant sea of parking that are only active a few days a year. Baseball, arguably, much more than uh, any, any other sport because there are so many games, uh, or roughly 100 uh, in a year. Um, but we thought, what if, what if this new stadium could really be the, the, the kind of foundation for the cultural life of the city? What if we could bring the ballpark back into, into the park? And essentially, baseball started in parks, and then at some point, a guy got the idea to build a fence uh, around the park and, and, uh, and charge tickets. Uh, so we thought, what if we could somehow bring the park back? So instead of this kind of enclosed stadium, what if the main concourse was actually Main Street? Um, and because baseball is an asymmetrical sport with the outfield, what if the entire stadium could open up to the, to the city and the water and the views? Um, so we are located uh, in the port of Portland, uh, of Oakland. Um, the stadium somehow becomes this kind of extension uh, uh, of the city grid. The, the circular stadium kind of distorts the, the, the streets, creates a series of squares. The main concourse is actually this kind of main public promenade called Athletics Way. Um, and then basically imagine as the, as the roof dips down, it almost becomes um, the kind of Oakland equivalent of the, of the High Line, uh, a public park that is part of the, um, the experience uh, of the game. Uh, but 250 days a year, it's actually a park for the, the citizens of Oakland. Uh, we also, we can comfortably refer to the High Line because we're working with field ops on the, on the landscape. Um, but essentially, imagine that 365 days a year, this is part of the enjoyable space of, of this new neighborhood. Uh, also, the, normally, the, 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 the seats that are the furthest away from the game would be the lousiest. Here, they have this kind of amazing experience of actually being part of the, of the park experience. So that uh, basically, 100 days a year, they shut down uh, access to the park, like if you have a concert in Central Park. Um, and it becomes part of the, of the spectator experience. All the, the, the restaurants and cafes uh, open up to the park, but that also means that the other days they open up to the park so you can actually go there uh, and have a coffee uh, even if you're just living or working in the, in the neighborhood. So you have this kind of connection from the, from the inside to the out. Um, above, of course, the running track on the game day is part of the, uh, of the circulation, uh, and on a non-game day it's part of the experience of living uh, in, in Oakland. Uh, the same for the picnic lawn, uh, both for game days and, and outside game days. So, so suddenly the, um, the stadium doesn't become this kind of massive, massive sort of empty uh, white elephant uh, in a kind of void in the city. It actually becomes a kind of bringer of life and energy into, uh, 
uh, into a new, uh, a new neighborhood. And of course, also because of the, the kind of asymmetry uh, in the extreme, you have this kind of incredible view out over uh, the, the port uh, towards uh, uh, San Francisco. That is part of the, of the experience. Uh, for the facade, we wanted to spend as little money on, on the enclosure as possible. So uh, we need to provide some shelter from the, from the wind. So we came up with this idea of, of this kind of uh, louvered uh, structure that is facing the predominant direction of the wind. Um, and then basically, where we have the concessions, where we have the circulation, we need to provide uh, wind protection. Uh, so it almost becomes like this kind of series of scarves wrapped around uh, the building, just providing only the necessary uh, protection. And, and, and even if we were trying to make this kind of almost skeletal non-building, it actually ends up having a, a, a rather sort of elegant uh, expression. And also means that when you arrive, you, you literally walk over the edge of the stadium and, and onto, the, uh, onto the field. Um, to provide access and to minimize the, the parking, of course, because it's part of an urban neighborhood, we can share the parking. But also, we have the BART, uh, um, the Bay Area Rapid Transit, um, only like a mile away. But you have to cross a 12-lane highway and a freight train. Uh, so the simplest way of connecting uh, is by putting a single mast. We can actually put a gondola that takes you straight from the BART uh, across both uh, uh, highway and, uh, and train tracks, uh, lands you on um, Jack London Square, uh, and from here you just walk straight onto, uh, 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 across the perimeter park and into, uh, into the game. So, so I think like, um, in, in many ways, taking this kind of idea of social infrastructure and the utilitarian and the social uh, and bringing it together into uh, a, a kind of new, um, a new hybrid. And then, then for the poster, I thought I had to at least mention this project we're doing with, uh, with Toyota. Because um, I, I think what we've seen over the, I think like 10 years ago, I was so keen on getting some buildings built that I didn't care about master plans because they took forever and they resulted in, uh, in nothing, uh, at least in the, in the horizon that I could overview. Now that I am older and more patient, uh, and I realize that two decades go quickly, uh, I have more appetite for, for, for master plans. And, um, and, and especially uh, because, of course, like, there's a lot of things that can only be dealt with at, on a kind of holistic level at, at a certain scale. And, um, and we had the, the fortunate encounter with Akio Toyota, who is the grandchild of the founder of Toyota and the namesake. Um, and he had this idea of turning uh, the site of two former factories at the base of Mount Fuji into an experimental city where we would look at studying the potential impact on, on cities from advances in personal mobility, mobility as a service, autonomy, robotics, smart homes, uh, sort of connectivity through AI, multi-generation, you know, ass assisted living, hydrogen-powered infrastructure, academic research and incubation. Um, and basically what we started to do was to look at the typical city of, of today. Uh, and you say today the, the street has basically everything. Uh, bikes, cars, uh, uh, pedestrians. And we thought maybe instead sort of to tailor different kinds of experiences. One street only for autonomous vehicles and, and pedestrians. One for mixed personal mobility, that's more like a promenade. And finally a park only uh, for pedestrians. And then every third street varies and weaves in both directions. So you can actually walk through this entire city as a pedestrian moving only through a park or only along a promenade. Um, so the roofs uh, are uh, powering uh, the city with uh, uh, building integrated photovoltaics. And then basically all these different intersections between the three different kinds of streets allows Toyota and collaborating companies to test uh, the Toyota Connected City Traffic Management System. Uh, there's a matter net for the delivery of goods. Uh, Toyota is one of the world pioneers in fuel cell technology using hydrogen, which is one of the most uh, efficient ways of storing energy. Uh, uh, goods can be delivered directly into the homes. There's like assisted living, uh, uh, also for the, for the elderly. Of course, like the demographics of Japan is, is the oldest. Uh, in the world, so in many ways they are experiencing right now what we will soon. And then a lot of the labs and the, and the research uh, 
of Toyota and their related companies is happening in the, in the work environments. And, and one of the things we also found is that m maybe with, with companies like Amazon delivering a lot of uh, the goods directly to people's homes, the sort of social and cultural spaces of retail are diminishing and maybe there was a way to, to reinvent the marketplace or the fairground uh, at, at the heart of the of this uh, of the city, um, so of course this is a, this is a very kind of high level um, uh, introduction. But but the basic thinking is by purpose building this kind of first uh, uh, woven city um, around this kind of module of of the three different kinds of ways of moving that are interwoven. That means that the street gets very different social and cultural qualities depending on what kind of street it is having this kind of modular system of every nine uh, block being a, a, an open uh, a sort of a public program, and then with the possibility of scaling some of the public programs to become larger uh, elements. Um, not only can we actually conduct this research in a purpose-built environment, but you can also apply the same pattern onto in this case, Barcelona, New York, or, or Tokyo. So it has a lot of sort of general applicability that means that what the, the kind of experience we can harvest uh, at the base of Mount Fuji could potentially uh, uh, be, be taken, uh, taken elsewhere. So um, maybe as a, as a kind of last uh, endeavor, uh, of course, all of these um, Projects are terrestrial, uh, and uh, over, over the last uh, two, two and a half years, um, we have uh, been increasingly interested in, in, uh, in, in, in looking a little bit beyond um, to, to the point, and I, and I think it's maybe also uh, maybe a word of advice, like, because we started saying this to each other, I think, three, three years ago, that uh, we, we, we felt that it would be amazing if we could build uh, on another planet than Earth. Um, and then by saying it to each other and being more and more serious about it, um, this, uh, this uh, December we got um, selected to build a spaceport for the Norwegian government uh, on the Arctic Circle. So uh, if you tell each other and everybody else uh, the story long enough, uh, eventually someone uh, bites. Um, but, we, but we actually started by working for the... Um, we were working with Hyperloop One, uh, the kind of Elon Musk founded... Uh, uh, supersonic vacuum tube magnetic uh, levitation train uh, and, and got introduced to the Ministry of the Future in Dubai uh, and they asked us to look at uh, creating a human colony on Mars. Every two years Mars and Earth are the orbits are aligned so you can actually get uh, to, um, to Mars according to Elon Musk in, in three months. Um, that's the same time it took 500 years ago uh, uh, to get from uh, from, um, from Spain to South America. Uh, so, and it didn't stop the Europeans from going to the Americas. So, um, uh, also one of the things about Mars is that it's, it's a relatively temperate planet. Uh, on a nice summer day on equator on Mars, you have 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like a Danish summer. Uh, gravity is 38%, so a 100 pound person would weigh 38 pounds on uh, Mars. <laughs> It's a three-month diet that's more powerful than anything. Uh, uh, and then the miracle is that Mars and Earth has the same seasonal tilt. So you have the same seasons. They're only four uh, twice as long on Mars because the year is twice as long. And then the miracle, for instance, if you would move to uh, uh, Mercury, a day lasts 175 days. So when the sun sets, it's almost 90 days before it rises again. That's a long night. Uh, on Mars, it's the same, only you can snooze 40 minutes longer every morning on Mars, because the day is 40 minutes longer. Which means that the, the kind of bio clock we have and every living organism has is very adjusted to Mars. There's no uh, magnetic field protecting from radiation. Uh, it's half the diameter, but the same amount of real estate, because they have no liquid oceans. Um, and we've been going to Mars, uh, so we know a lot about Mars. Uh, we've we looked at the craters, we've seen dried out archipelagos, landslides, dust devils. Um, so we have good knowledge about Mars. And actually, uh, one of the miracles, the, the, the blue planet and the red planet, uh, 
but because of small particulates in the air where our sunrises turn red, the sunrises on the red planet actually turn blue, which is something I hope many in this room will one day experience personally. Uh, there is, if you remove the biosphere from Earth, like in the Atacama Desert in Chile, it looks very much like Mars because it has very much the same uh, 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 minerals. And we started just like looking a little bit at Earth. This is in Tunisia. What looks like a lifeless desert is actually a dense, lively community where this kind of um, troglodyte houses carved out of the rock create a more sort of stable environment protected from uh, the, the rays of the sun uh, and the fluctuation of, of temperature. Uh, and of course, another example is Kangaluswak in Greenland, in the Arctics, uh, the igloos using the insulating uh, uh, aspect of ice uh, and the sort of efficiency of the spherical uh, form uh, to protect from, uh, from the environments. So there's a lot of great things. There's a few problems remaining. There's too much radiation for humans, very low pressure, uh, cold temperatures, no breathable air, and no ready-to-use water. Uh, and also, we can't bring too much. Uh, I think by the most optimistic estimates, it's going to cost $6,600 to bring uh, two pounds of goods to Mars. Um, this is what we need. Uh, so basically, we need to somehow pr combine the ecosystem to sustain human life with the ecosystem to su sustain plant life into one integrated ecosystem. So we just started looking at what we have. We have regolith uh, that you can sort into uh, ice that gives you water, basalt stones, fine sands, you can make bricks, uh, ceramics, uh, concrete. You can sort the fine sands into silicia, aluminum, and iron oxide, among other things. You can make aluminum, glass, you can make uh, 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 technology, photovoltaics. With photovoltaics, you can make power. With power, you can run electrolysis on the water. You can split it into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, together with the CO2 of the Martian atmosphere, it's like 93% CO2. You can make, uh, with a Sabatier reactor, you can make methane, that together with oxygen is a great rocket propellant. Uh, as a byproduct, you get carbon monoxide and more water. The carbon monoxide, with the iron oxide, you can make steel. Together with the water, you can use chemical reactions to create different kinds of plastics, soft plastics, hard plastics. Uh, with the soft plastics, of course, Everything needs to be recycled because everything is so incredibly valuable on Mars. Uh, with the uh, soft plastics, we can make inflatable membranes that we can make biodomes for growing plants, for root zone gardens, uh, for leisure, uh, for aquaponics, hydroponics, uh, for agriculture. And finally, we can sustain human life using only what's actually available on Mars. If you look at the different kinds of Enclosures, inflatables are great for keeping a pressurized environment, but not for keeping meteors or radiation out. 3D printed structures provide more protection, uh, not enough. And finally, excavated structures uh, with seven meters or 20 feet of regolith is enough to protect you from uh, the radiation. So none of them work on their own combined. They actually tick all the boxes. So imagine creating inflatable membranes, digging, excavating material, you use it to 3D print, and then you just have to regulate how much time you spend in the different degrees of exposure. But we found that a typical American only spends 8% of the day outdoor, so that should be uh, uh, okay. Uh, and then of course they can combine and grow until you have a, uh, a city. Uh, as part of the experiment is to begin in an environment uh, in the desert uh, outside Dubai that looks uh, like Mars, uh, but is a little uh, warmer. Um, but the idea is to use the same techniques, the 3D printed uh, uh, structures using the local available as sand, the, the high efficiency uh, uh, agriculture to create this kind of environment where you can experience how enjoyable uh, the kind of Martian vernacular could actually be like, not like living in a tin can, but in this kind of charming uh, clay-esque, 3D printed, uh, uh, casbah-like structure. Uh, actually, water is a better, is seven times better shield against radiation, so it wouldn't be unlikely to have these underground structures with three feet of uh, aquarium above that provides daylight but protects you from, from the radiation. So some of the things that would be nuts on Earth could actually make a lot of sense 
uh, on Mars. So, um, and why is this interesting? And one of the things, the more we started thinking about when you're starting uh, on a new planet from scratch, uh, you have to somehow really understand ecosystems. And if you look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, eight of them deal directly with the built environment. And just a few data points. On Earth, we have, let's, let's call it one and a half billion cubic meters of water. On Mars, only five million cubic meters of ice. So you have to be so, it's so precious, the water on, on Mars. We have outdoor agriculture. We have to do it in structure at least 10 times more efficient on, on Mars. And one of the main sources of global warming and the climate crisis we're experiencing is fossil fuels. You have no fossil fuels on Mars because you have no fossils. So um, in a way, many of the things that would allow us to be capable of surviving on Mars are the same things that would allow us to be great custodians of, uh, of planet Earth. And if you sort of gradually imagine over 200 years um, getting breathable air, getting uh, liquid water, you can see that Mars doesn't look so different than, uh, uh, than Earth. Um, and that basically brought us to uh, the last thing that I'd like to, to end with, is that one of the things we've been thinking lately is that we seem to be so incredibly incapable of dealing with the climate crisis. Um, and we were thinking why, because humans have actually sh shown to be incredibly capable of taking very resource demanding, multi-generational efforts, like building cathedrals. The great cathedral in Köln took 632 years to complete, and they still completed it. Uh, we laugh at the, at the Catalans because they're still building Sagrada Familia, but they've only been building for 137 years, so they're not supposed to be done yet. Um, <laughs> and the Romans were capable of building the, the Roman aqueduct system for more than 500 years, bringing uh, uh, fresh water to all of their urban settlements. So how come that we could do it? It's because there was a master plan. You know, when the first architect uh, of the Köln Cathedral died, the next architect worked on on those same drawings, and the next one, and the next one, and I think you probably went through 20 different architects in, uh, in 600 years or, or more. Um, so I think one of the problems of climate change and climate action is that it's the realm of scientists, climate scientists, that are mostly academics, which means that they're very good at science and academic accuracy, but not so much at entrepreneurship and action and then you have politicians that are maybe not so good at something that requires a 50-year or 100-year commitment because they have election cycles of four or eight years. So even a short architectural project takes longer than that. Um, so what we thought, what if we, because architects are maybe, we make master plans for buildings, for city blocks, for neighborhoods, for cities, for regions, even for countries, why not make a master plan for the planet? Uh, so uh, normally we, we get hired to do things, but in this case there was no obvious client except maybe Greta Thunberg. Uh, so we said, okay, so we started it ourselves and I'm just gonna reveal a few of the things we started looking at. It's gonna be another eight minutes. Uh, first of course, Climate change has been going on catastrophically uh, since the dawn of planet Earth, uh, from a kind of a ball of lava to the kind of heavy bombardment of meteors four billion years ago to the snowball two and a half billion years ago, the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago, much more like current Earth and, and present day. Um, and when you look, this is 500 million years back, you can see there's always been sort of fluctuations in CO2 uh, related to fluctuations in temperature. The blue line is temperature and the kind of shaded uh, uh, graph is, is CO2. So there's a clear um, relationship. If you look at the last 500,000 years, you can see the, the ice ages are always valleys uh, in the CO2 levels uh, separated by peaks that also correspond to uh, rising temperatures and vice versa. Uh, and if you look at the last 500 years, you see relatively stable 
and then sort of, let's say, uh, 150 years ago, it really starts escalating. And, and on this graph, it doesn't look so, so bad, but it's 407 particles per million, uh, and we have to go back 20 to 30 million years before we find the same levels of CO2 that we have currently. Um, none of these animals uh, existed uh, back then, including, of course, humans. Uh, so it's a very unprecedented situation. And just to give you another level, like regardless of global warming, at 1,000 particles per million, uh, the sort of uh, ventilation in, in, in any room kicks in because it becomes unhealthy for humans to breathe those levels of CO2. So, so we're definitely not just warming the planet, we're also making it less uh, habitable for, uh, for human life. So you have uh, different kinds of greenhouse gases. Uh, four of them are affected by, by human activity. Um, and of the four, uh, of course, carbon uh, dioxide is, uh, and, and methane maybe are the ones we talk about. There's also nitrous oxide loop and, and so-called F gases. I'm going to focus on carbon uh, dioxide. So you have a lot of sort of stored carbon. And you can see if you have 610 gigatons of carbon in our vegetation, you have a million times more in, uh, in the sediments. And that's essentially what we're releasing by burning fossil fuels. So you have two, two carbon dioxide loops. One takes millions of years. It's volcanic activity that then becomes sequestered uh, in, in rocks and sand and is then sort of sedimented on the ocean floors and, and is pushed back uh, through tectonic movement into uh, magma. And then you have a more annual loop, which is essentially living beings uh, um, uh, absorbing uh, CO2 and then sort of releasing it through respiration, decomposition, uh, and of course human emissions. And currently we are increasing our CO2 emissions with 4 billion tons per year. Methane, a kind of similar loop, methane only stays in the atmosphere for nine years, but because every year we're releasing another 10 million tons, primarily because of rice fields and, and ruminant animals, uh, it's also adding to the equation. And you look, 75% of the greenhouse effects is attributed to CO2, it's the biggest problem, 14% uh, methane and the rest to uh, nitrous oxide and F gases. If you look at the CO2 equivalent, the F gases are really the, the worst sinners. They are 3,000 times more impactful than CO2. There's just a lot less of it. And if you want to look at how much carbon we're releasing into the atmosphere every year, it's, it would be a two by two by two kilometer cube. This is downtown London by, by comparison, but like of solid coal that is going into the, into the atmosphere, or 35,000 oil tankers. Um, there's another aspect, which is the shine effect. So Vanta Black, the Anish Kapoor uh, patented uh, uh, black, the least reflective material on Earth, has a shine effect of zero, and perfect white of one. And just to give you an idea, an ocean or a parking lot has almost no shine effect, so it absorbs a lot of heat. So the more open ocean, the more heat is absorbed. The more parking lots, the more heat is absorbed. Whereas fresh snow has a really good shine effect. And to give you an idea how impactful this is, if, if Earth was all ocean, we would have an average temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. Today it's 15 degrees, so twice as warm as now. If a third of the planet was glacial, it would be frozen. So 1% of, of change in the shine effect of Earth is uh, the equivalent of doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's also an important factor that right now works against us. Um, so what are our energy sources? We, we have four sources. The sun that provides uh, photovoltaics, solar heating, fossil fuels, wind power is all stored solar energy. Earth, geothermal energy, mostly because of gravity compression. The moon, tidal turbine energy, uh, mainly because of gravity. And then uh, nuclear energy from atoms. So, and basically all the different forms of, of energy are related. So basically, let's say, gravity creates pressure that creates nuclear activity uh, that pr provides, um, through fusion, provides sunlight. Uh, through photosynthesis, sunlight is translated into chemical energy that can then be burned to provide heat that can 
with an engine be translated into kinetic movement that can then be turned into uh, electricity. And over the years, we've been sort of mastering more and more of these kinds of translations. And any kind of energy source is translation from one source to the other. So uh, a water mill or hydropower is gravity turned into kinetic movement and from there into electricity. Uh, uh, f nuclear fission is uh, nuclear energy translated into heat and from there into mechanical and electrical. Uh, batteries from chemical to electrical. Um, and if you look at the energy storage, for instance, batteries, which is a great thing, it's, it's not very efficient. Half a ton of batteries has the same stored energy as uh, five kilos or 10 pounds of, uh, of hydrogen, which is why it's, it's a very interesting energy source. Today, we spend 153,000 terawatt hours per year. That's our energy bill. A third roughly from electricity, then transportation and agriculture on an equal, and then construction and, and industry. Uh, and if you look at the energy sources, even though we have a lot of different renewable energy sources, m the vast amount, like 85% of our energy, comes from uh, non-renewable. So you can see 200 years ago, we only had traditional biofuel, burning wood, basically. Then came coal, then came oil, then came gas, uh, and then you have, then came uh, nuclear, and then, of course, you have the renewables. But of all the 15% of renewable, two-thirds of it is actually just burning wood. So not at the end also actually leading to uh, CO2 emissions, even though you can argue that you can replant it. So then we started looking at how efficient are the different sources. We also looked at who's the biggest culprit. Today, this is basically China, the biggest culprit, Asia. But if you look at it historically, the last 200 years, the US and the EU have definitely contributed uh, uh, our share. And then we said, okay, so what, what's the job we have to solve? I, I, don't worry, I'm not gonna like solve the whole thing uh, in the next two minutes. <laughs> but just to sort of illustrate the kind of architectural thinking behind it, it's not enough to provide 153,000 terawatts because we're gonna be 10 billion people and everybody will eventually have the quality of life of Singapore, which is currently uh, the highest uh, living standard so that means that we need to have 750,000 terawatts. Uh, if solar would be a current technology for solar, we could provide all of that energy with this amount of PVs, uh, or with this amount of uh, windmill parks, uh, or this amount of nuclear, because actually you only need this amount of real estate for nuclear, but because of the plume exposure pathway emergency planning zone, and anyone who watched uh, Chernobyl on HBO uh, knows what I'm talking about. Uh, it would actually uh, be relatively inefficient in terms of space. Um, uh, hydroelectricity, we don't have enough hydroelectricity uh, uh, or biomass. Um, also, there's the idea of planting forest to sequester carbon, but we would have to plant the entire landmass of Earth every third year to sequester enough carbon, so it can only be part uh, of a solution. If you look at the different renewables, they've all gone down, especially solar, massively over the last half decade, except hydro, which has gone up, maybe because of preservation and construction. Um, hydropower currently provides only 3% uh, of our power. It's, it's believed that there's a, a, a bigger potential but not more, like not enough to provide the entire uh, uh, Earth. But 71 of the countries on Earth could actually be delivering European living standard with the amount of hydroelectricity they have uh, available. But just to give you an idea, uh, the biggest uh, hydro station in the world, uh, uh, Churchill Falls in Canada, uh, provides, you could provide the same amount of energy with solar with a much smaller area. Wind power only is 0.6% of the power uh, on Earth, and you have a, a very large untapped uh, potential. Mostly closer you get to the poles, the more uh, wind power potential, especially offshore. And of course, solar power, uh, again, uh, the, 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 the brighter, uh, the more potential. Uh, and if you look at since the 70s, the price has gone drastically down, so solar is really of, of all the different sources, wind and solar seems to be the best ones. And then you have this thing called the intermittency, intermittence problem, 
This is looking at the UK in January. A lot of wind power, somewhat irregular, and not so much uh, um, solar power, and only in a very small time space. Uh, in the same, in UK in June, you see much bigger solar potential and much lower wind speeds. So that, that becomes a problem. If you look at it over the year, you have this kind of almost inverse uh, graph. And you basically have two cycles, uh, the kind of seasonal cycle and the 24-hour cycle. Uh, and the 24-hour cycle also varies over, over the year, uh, winter and summer. Um, so if you cut it at where you say you have minimum six hours of peak solar uh, in, the, in the winter, um, that gives you roughly 99% of Earth's population lives within uh, this zone. Because of the, the radius of Earth, you never have more than 10,000 kilometers to the nearest sunlight. Uh, so if, if, say, if each sixth of the planet could provide, uh, if each 24-hour zone could provide a sixth of the power of the planet, the side that has light could actually power uh, the other side. Um, and how could you do this? So basically because like where you have, you know, the, the shorter the radius, the shorter the distance to, uh, from night to day. Uh, and with current high voltage connections, you lose 3% of the power per thousand kilometers. This means that at the maximum uh, loss, you, you lose roughly a third of the power if you're going all the way to the other side. So one of the things we started looking at, you already have regional grids. This is one grid. This is another grid. Europe is one grid. And there's plans to connect uh, Europe, Northern Europe, and, and North Africa and the Middle East. There's plans to connect the East and the West Coast and, uh, and uh, and, uh, and, and Mexico. Um, so you have all of these partial plans. So what if you could actually create an entire uh, worldwide grid? The sunny side could power the, uh, the dark side, or the windy side could power the, the less windy side. And just to give you an idea, this is London, uh, the yearly solar output from London over the year. And within the same sort of a, a, a longitude, you have a Cape Town that has the exact opposite pattern, obviously, over the year. So if you can connect them, they can even each other out, solving part of the intermittence problem. And if you look across, you can also provide this kind of even uh, presence of power. Uh, if you look at wind within the same slice, the same sort of one hour slice of Earth, uh, we just like looked at a different kind of series of locations across Europe and, uh, and Africa, and you end up evening out because the wind is always blowing somewhere. So you end up actually having uh, close to peak uh, uh, generation speed uh, always somewhere within the zone. So maybe this kind of seasonal cycle and 24-hour cycle, this kind of grid could unite us all energy-wise. And then, of course, there's the Pacific. Uh, that we haven't solved yet. Um, <laughs> and maybe just like a few data points and, and then, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Of course, we have to look at everything. So we started looking just at water. This is how much water we have on Earth it w if it was like a ball, because um, the oceans are very shallow. And if you look at all that water, very little of it is fresh water, 2.5%. And of the fresh water, very little is surface fresh water, 30% is groundwater, and like two thirds is glaciers. And of the surface fresh water, 3% in the atmosphere, a quarter of it is in all living things, uh, humans included, H half a percent in rivers, 6% uh, in soil moisture and swamps, 20% in lakes, and again, two thirds in ground ice. So basically, water is salt water, and fresh water is ice. Uh, in the last 100 years, we would six times doubled our consumption of, uh, of water, four trillion cubic meters of water every year. Um, most of it goes to agriculture, and of the agriculture, most goes into uh, meat. And we are getting increasingly uh, dry zones, and the bad news is that it's expensive energy-wise to desalinate, for instance. If we would have to desalinate the 
increase uh, uh, of, of water consumption to reach 10 billion people, it would be 20% of our current uh, uh, electricity uh, supply. And then, of course, looking at pollution, just to give some, some vulgar facts, every hour we produce a pile of 38 meters. This is Burj Khalifa, and this is the cone of plastic bottles uh, every day. And every month we can bury the tallest tower on planet Earth in a cone of plastic bottles. And when you look at the flow of plastic, the vast majority is discarded after a single use. Um, a good part of it is still in use in different components. The stuff that gets recycled quickly gets discarded again, and then a small fraction becomes put to sort of more constant use or incinerated for, for the energy value. If you look at the sources of energy, the vast majority of the mismanaged plastic is in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, the global river plastic input to the oceans, massively Asia. If you look at the 20 biggest river, rivers, it's basically Asia and a little bit of Nigeria and Brazil, but really Asia, and massively packaging. Uh, so these are the sort of mismanaged pollution hotspots, and these are the outlets into the global oceans, creating this kind of uh, distribution because of the currents of plastic, uh, where the biggest patch is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, which is becoming a, a massive issue. So essentially, what, what we're trying to do, as you can see, is try to apply the kind of tangible, practical thinking we almost took the kind of way we would normally approach an architectural project and a master plan. So this is the, the kind of index as we're making it for the master plan of the planet and, and going through it with this kind of pragmatic utopian approach, hoping that we can develop insights and ideally a master plan for the planet that could be in a way handed over to corporations and governments with a much more tangible and much more promising concrete plan of action than, than the reports or the sort of political agendas that, uh, uh, that exist today. Thank you, Bjarke, for making things very easy for me to respond. <laughs> I'll keep it short, and I'm sure there are many, many questions, but I, you know, I just wanted to... Um, Maybe retrace a little bit the lecture and, and really open it up uh, pretty fast where, where you left us. Uh, you know, you opened with, uh, you know, beautifully designed small restaurant where you showed the details in every corner and there was a notion of vernacular and I was like, okay, taking on bigness and starting with scale and, um, and, then, and then, you know, the projects are, are you know, fantastic. Uh, but it also really feels, and I think that's been sort of um, your s signature as a kind of strategic thinking thinker uh, as an architect, there's a kind of repertoire of strategies, right? The, the vernacular, the twist, is a, you know, I think that's trademark. Uh, um, landform, you know, whether it's, 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 it's the bridge or the, then you have the wedge and, um, and, and and it's, it's clear that the sort of complexity that one, very architectural complexity and pleasure that you find in the restaurant with the materials and the kind of aggregation and, you know, you, you sort of get rid of slightly as you scale up. I mean, it, 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 it you know, there's a kind of singularity to the, to the gesture and, and I'm thinking, okay, there's a simplicity also that, that sort of, uh, um, um, a enables a new form of complexity, and, and in a way, uh, what you're conquering is not so much architectural form or a sort of narrative about architecture, but uh, the excitement is in bringing architecture to new programs, to finding new typologies, to write this sort of territorial um, expansion of architecture's capacity, and, uh, and, and almost, um, and this is where the kind of urban realm comes in, you know, you, you, uh, where um, you almost sacrifice architecture um, as architecture 
for what it does to the urban realm, for what it, you know, what you call social infrastructure, for what, is, what, it, not, what it enables. Um, and I was thinking about the last utopia in this country, which is new urbanism, uh, which sort of declared that in order for us to um, address questions of, uh, um, you know, walking and livability and density, et cetera, we had to sacrifice architecture as an, as an object of focus and, and, you know, doesn't matter what style it is or whatever, you know, it's okay. And I, and I, and I think for me, and I mean this very positively, um, there's a sense of if we need to leave architecture behind, uh, you know, um, w we should. Um, and and then and then there's this kind of cut with the and you, you 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 almost get excited yourself. Okay, I can do all these strategies. I can provide architecture. I can provide solutions. I can do it. Like okay, now let's you you actually use the term. Let's take off. Right. We, so it's a kind of like. Okay, now is there is there a real challenge? And then, okay, there's a Toyota smart city, and I'm thinking pragmatic utopian or utopian pragmatism, and you're like, okay, this is getting into utopian dystop dystopic uh, proposition. I mean, you're thinking about the smart city as also a city that is about control and surveillance, and and all these happy people are, you know, I wouldn't want to. Live, I wouldn't want to live in that city under the... Just wait and see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, we're already in it, and yeah. it's very scary. And, um, um, and so I'm, for me, that's a kind of parenthesis. But, but then I, I, think, I think the assertion of the... The, the reassertion and the faith in, uh, of the master plan, you know, I mean, we are here in an academic setting with, where the master plan has been murdered and murdered <laughs> over and over again for all the... A dystopic condition that it produced, the uh, exclusions, the conflicts, the uh, the sort of segregation, the uh, the power structures. I mean, this is always a result of the master plan. And but you reassert the master plan, and I I think that um, it, it's kind of very interesting. I, I guess where I'm getting at is is and and this has been also part of your power as an architect is kind of to dust off to say, okay, well, we can't, you know, just stay in that space of criticism and, 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 and maybe we do need, a, you know, a master planet. And I think the, the passion and, you, you know, as you, as you sort of deployed this, this blueprint for the planet, you know, um, um, towards the end, it almost be, becomes believable. <laughs> where, where, so where are you taking this? I mean, I, I, where are you taking this? Uh, and, and throughout your work, you suspend the kind of political, you, you present yourself as a kind of a, a, you know, a-contextual, apolitical kind of architect. Uh, and, and, and you know, obviously climate change is not, we're not addressing it, not because we don't have the technology, and not because we don't, we've had it for a long time. Uh, we've known this is coming for a long time. We're not addressing it because of because we don't have the political will, because of power structure, because of politics, because of governance, um, um, because because of the West. Um, you know. So so, what do you do with the master plan? Who is your audience? And and you know, I, I think it's it, you know it's it's, it's so. Uh, I mean, as as it, as it thickens, I think it's a very interesting. I just. I just, and I'm not, what is, what is your hope? With no, no, exactly, it's, 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 a, it's so. a good question. And I, and I also like, a, it's, it's very early days, uh, but, but, it was like, but I think maybe you found your calling is what I'm saying. Like you're, you're like, I think that's the realm where I, I see your passion and. No, so. but I, I, I definitely think that, the, because it, 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 it came from the fact that the, as architects, we're so used to waiting, mm -hmm. um, for someone else to ask us to do something. And so, to the point where we're almost unable to do anything out of our own energy, right? So, so, so um, and, and we, just because of, um, we, we did a kind of very significant study for Mars, I just showed the kind of, the, the tip of the iceberg. We, we did an even more in-depth study for uh, a potential lunar base. So uh, we, we did a study for floating cities with the United Nations. Um, so, so we've looked into a lot of this kind of more and more 
complex holistic thinking, and and we began to feel a little bit that wh why uh, why does the discourse around climate change remain so you know like like e even the people that are supposed to be the activists, all they do is in a way complain about the inaction, uh, and there's a limit to how much you can march uh, yourself out of the problem. Like you can demonstrate, you can make a lot of uh, billboards, uh, and you can you can but you can walk all the way to the White House and back again. But what we really need is like a, you know a kind of a kind of blueprint or a kind of you know, a kind of project schedule or something like. So we, so we were just beginning to think, because, because we do. I do feel, and in, in a way, that the, what I try to show by starting with, with Noma, and ending with the whole planet, is that of course, the level of detail diminishes, except there's the the the, the level I of think complexity that's the does problem, not. Right? But but one does not rule out the other. So the idea is that, just like in nature. At, at the macro level and the micro level, there's, a, there's almost an equal amount of complexity. The system of rivers and the nervous system and the, the distribution of water in the branches of a leaf. Um, you can see like, so, so but, but the ability to apply yourself at either scale, uh, and I think, like you're saying, the master plan has been this forbidden thing because there's a lot of examples of, of also because often it becomes this kind of unifying aesthetic that has been applied at the wrong scale. So it's not really understanding systems or complexities of relationships or flows, but a p superimposing a kind of universal aesthetic. And, and that's, that's, that's not at all. We're, we're trying to really understand the, the ecosystem that we've inherited and try to see if we can, in a, in a way, d deal with it um, like, because you can apply architectural thinking at the scale of a piece of furniture, a restaurant, a city block, a city, why not a planet? No, I, I think you're making that clear. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I think you're making a, a clear case for architectural thinking, um, both its pros and its cons. I think, you know, what it, what it puts forth and what it, what it leaves behind and what it can handle. And, but it's, it's also interesting to note that today, the level of urbanization that is occurring um, in, in places like China and, and, and the Middle East, et cetera, are, are part of the problem with, with climate change, right? The rapid urbanization you know, that, that many of your, the master plans are enabling is also so. Anyway, I don't, I don't really, um, uh, I guess my only question, w or, or my only um, uh, concern, let's say, would be that um, I'd be curious what Greta Thunberg would think about your master planet, you know, or um, uh, in terms of, I, I, I think it, I find it very difficult today to be engaged as an architect as if we are operating in a kind of political void in this moment. And so that's what I find interesting. Yeah, I actually, yeah, we've been having some um, conversations about this. And, you know, I've, I, I rarely declare any kind of political affinity, but I find that I am often uh, much more in the middle than many of my friends. Uh, and definitely much more in the middle than the political landscape right now, which is so, uh, you know, I'm not fr 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 fragmented. And, and, and one of the things that yeah. I... I'm not I asking for your, no, no, but your, I, but, um, your, your personal politics. I'm saying that no, but I'm, of, I'm actually going to do it. A lot of the plans that you're looking at, a lot of the plans that you're looking at, a lot of the large-scale infrastructural plans that you're looking at were the result Right of a certain political will at, at a certain scale. Yeah, but I, but right. I think so, the, I mean, interest, the interesting thing is you can't that fantasize about that level of architectural empowerment without, you know, at least acknowledging that they are the result of a certain political context. Yeah, but but I think the what what you find is that 
when, when on the wow. on the political the spectrum, when you go happening. towards the extreme. That, hello, hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> Are you interrupting? Who is that? Uh, testing. God is testing. It works. Okay. One, two. It's, it's One, working. Two. No, I just want to say, like, the, the more you go on the political extremes, on the extreme left or the extreme right, or, or not extreme, but like the further, the, the more you are deliberately not including the other viewpoint. And I think one of the things, climate change cannot be solved with governments yeah. only, and it cannot I be solved understand. with companies only. And I think, so, so like, if, if I would declare myself anything, it would be social liberal, because you cannot have the collective at the expense of the individual, but you can also not have the individual at the expense of the collective. You somehow have to find the greatest possible freedom, but also the greatest possible c care. Uh, and, and I think the, what, what we are finding is that this kind of space in the middle, uh, the pragmatic utopian, where, where sometimes you agree with, with, with one wing, sometimes you agree with the other wing, but eventually, that's, so you can call it like the sort of the radical middle, uh, because um, I, I, th I think that's, that's what the world needs, is a lot of different skill sets, a lot of different capacities for action coming together. Uh, and, and I think by having, by having a master plan, by having blueprints, you can get masons and carpenters and craftsmen uh, to build a cathedral, but if you don't have the master plan, how are they? How are we and going to collaborate? And the slaves. Sorry. You also need the slaves. To I don't build think the, the cathedrals were built by slaves. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I don't think they had the level of uh, uh, standard of living that Singapore has. All I'm saying, I'm not asking for your. All I'm saying is that I think it would make, as a, you know, I, I think that it's, it would be. Look, the most, without John Lennon, as a slide, the master plan knit doesn't work. You needed to insert John Lennon. So I'm just saying that I think as architects we can project, and I think we can project more than form. We can also situate uh, our architectural desires. We, you know, we're imagining also societies, you of all people. Uh, and I think that I miss that dimension, which I know you have and you bring in your project. So the kind of narrative that you brought to the your restaurant, where you had this relationship to the chef, who had the relationship to the food, who has, you know, the, the kind of subject of your architecture, I think could inhabit your larger work. And that would make it stronger. That's all. I mean, I just, I miss, I miss that scale of humanity that we find in your restaurant. It's, exactly. But it's, 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 again, it's like you, you can't talk about the planet and then get lost in the joinery of the bricks. All you uh, need is John Lennon. All you need is to show the slide of John Lennon. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. There you go. Okay. We can open it up. Hi. Um, great lecture. I have two questions. The first one is um, for the Mars project. Are you guys actually looking at like um, science fictions, like Marshall Chronicles, to in for inspirations? Um, my second question is: I can't help but notice that um, the way you set up your project is really similar to reminds me a lot of SML XL. And my question is: Do you think and and the smaller project, the the more architectural projects have like the skills, the skills that they require is quite different from the more uh, master planet projects where there's more imaginations or there's more research that's involved. And I was wondering if you think architects and design thinkers e eventually are going to be two different professions. Um, and how are they joined together? Um, and what's your thoughts just in general on that topic? Yes, I think um, I, th I think in a, in a way that um, I, I have this kind of 
When I was um, when I was younger, I had a kind of arrogance about a, how you could that I, be, I believed that you could think your way to every, everything. Uh, and I think one of the things I learned when I uh, went to intern at the uh, at OMA, um, in the beginning, it, it kind of annoyed me that th there was so much work going on without uh, a lot of thought, I felt. Because I, I had somehow imagined that OMA would be all these kind of very coherent, very intellectual uh, people that would be sort of uh, discussing. And then once the idea had fully formed, they would make it. Uh, and instead, there was, and I, I remember I was almost shocked that, that one person came from Liebeskind's office, one person came from Eisenman's office, and one person came from Foster's office, and I was like, what the fuck are you doing in OMA? <laughs> like, uh, uh, and I, I wanted to go work for Frank Gehry, actually. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it was like, I, I could, it, it, like, it was not at all what I had expected, because I had expected everybody to maybe be like me, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, and then the work started happening, and there was no discourse. Uh, there was all kinds of random, you know, this and that and blah, blah. Uh, and, and through the kind of sheer m massive production of material, um, the possibility of discovering something more and more meaningful and gradually a kind of discourse could mature out of it. Um, and I think in that sense, you need both halves of the brain, the analytical and the kind of experimental, uh, the kind of action and the reaction. Uh, and, um, but therefore, I also think that you can, you can empower, because it's a, it's a constant feedback loop. So you can really empower the kind of tactile, sensual, sensitive uh, refineries with clear thinking, and you can empower scientific analysis with kind of tactile, sensual, experimental kind of longings. So I think that the pragmatic and the utopian, the creative and the analytical comes together, and I think maybe that's what we can offer. So in that, in that sense, I don't think that it's necessarily mm -hmm. different fields. Of course, at the end of the day, you need to have a certain amount of knowledge uh, and I think one of the luxuries that I think is true in a lot of our projects uh, is that we've been capable of working with arguably the best or some of the best chefs in the world uh, to imagine a restaurant, to, uh, to some of the best watchmakers in the world to imagine a museum of watchmaking, uh, some of the best sort of energy engineers, uh, some of the best uh, sort of automotive manufacturers. So, like, so I think the fact that we have access to people with very high degrees of knowledge, uh, and I think we've developed a kind of way to interview them and extract some of their knowledge and, and make it concrete in ways that we can use it. Um, I think that works at, at all scales. So in that sense, there is a kind of inquisitive p part of being an an architect is to translate this kind of highly specific knowledge into something that can be put into action in the physical world. Just to go back kind of to this idea of utopia and dystopia, um, thank you for a very inspiring lecture. And you presented a series of projects, of very successful projects, um, all realized in cities of the global north. And I'm wondering, and all, and then you move on to this, like. Uh, master planet uh, ideal that assumes kind of a best case scenario in every aspect of the project, and I guess it's not really assuming it, right? Well, I mean, in order for it to be successful, all of the elements of the puzzle need to fall into place a certain way, and I'm just curious if, in doing this research and developing these projects, you think and also analyze the worst case scenario and whether you take into account like the realities of, of uh, as uh, Dean Amal was saying, 
of maybe other systems of governance and other cities and other countries of the global south that maybe do things differently? And how, how do you see those two meeting to produce this uh, like master planet? Yes. Um, maybe I start here and then I get back. Uh, I mean, um, th thank you for almost uh, blaming me for working uh, so much in the global north. Because I learned recently uh, from a trip in South America that you're not supposed to work in South America or specifically Brazil. Uh, which I, have, of course, disagree with severely. And, uh, and, and of course, it is true that m most of the build work we have done has been in the Global North. It's also where I'm from, and it's where, where um, our offices are located. The most southern is Barcelona. Um, but I have to say that after having traveled in, uh, in South America the last three weeks, uh, I'm incredibly eager to, uh, uh, to get to work in the global south. Uh, and, um, and, and I think I, I think we have to find ways, and I think um, maybe this ties a little bit into uh, what, what you were saying over there. Like I think the kind of possibility and responsibility that comes with the, with the kind of creative platform we have now and the, I think the capacities we have is that we, we can maybe begin to engage uh, in situations that would be uh, difficult if not impossible for us to navigate previously. Um, and I think we are s slowly taking, uh, taking, uh, taking that on uh, and I think I really believe in, like, in, in Gandhi's kind of statement of that you, have, you should be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, because of course you can't, you know, but because you're not the President of the United States uh, or the General Secretary of the United Nations, uh, but you can make sure that what you do uh, makes that little difference. And that's, that's how Rome was built, you know, a, a brick by brick. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, I, I think one of the things that we have found uh, as, as we've evolved as a practice is that um, we have, I think somehow we have accumulated uh, insights and experiences and knowledge. And uh, of course, a lot of our projects have failed um, <laughs> monumentally recently. Uh, uh, it, uh, it has been announced that uh, Larry Silverstein wants to build uh, the original Foster design and not our two World Trade Center. Uh, so, uh, but that's like, it's, it's so business as usual in a way for an architect. Uh, and of course that project kind of died in my mind probably four years ago when James Murdoch's dad and brother uh, decided not to build his uh, his uh, his uh, his brainchild, um, the same James Murdoch, who is now openly criticizing the family and the Fox Network for denying uh, climate change. Um, but but um, so in that sense, uh, the good the, the good news is that all of those uh, failed attempts uh, and <coughs> stranded projects have accumulated a lot of insight and a lot of knowledge that that I think makes us increasingly capable of, uh, of taking on more and more complex challenges that would have been unimaginable uh, a decade ago. And that's also why we have the kind of mildly megalomaniac uh, no, no, no. idea of, of at least attempting to start this kind of research just saying like, what if we apply architectural thinking at the scale of the planet, looking at, uh, at the kind of human, because like, with if anyone can do it, you can do it. Okay. So you, sh you should do it. You should just just take it on. I mean, you built the 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 ski. You d you did it. So you can do it. You can do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.